Hi. Hey. hey. How are you? I'm good. Hold on. I'm trying to. Why does your your screen look so bright and colorful and mine looks so hazy I have and foggy? A, I have um, a light behind me because oh. I'm trying to be professional. How are you? I'm so, so good. good. How are you? I'm good. It's so good to see you. I know. It's been so long, like a lot of years. What is time, though, Lizzie? What does time even mean anymore? It's not really a thing. It doesn't really exist. It doesn't. It's all a <laughs> figment of our imagination. I know. Thank I, you so much for talking to me. Oh, my God. I know your you, schedule's insane right now. Everybody's schedule's insane. Come on, Lizzie. Yeah. It is. But I'll do anything for you. You know that. Oh, I appreciate it. Well, I want to well, tell I you. My, my wife's here. You want to say hi? Uh, yeah. I'm throwing you on. Come here. She has some. She's eating our from. <laughs> hi. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm so good. It's good to see you. It's so good to see you. I have no idea what you guys are doing, but I love this. We're hanging out. I love it. Just talking about bullying, you know, casually. Needs to be talked about. It does. For sure. <laughs> it does. Yeah. <laughs> it's so nice to meet you. You too. Although I think we've met before. Yeah. You met yeah. Me yeah. A few years ago. In person? In person. Yeah. It was yeah. for um, a screening. Did you come up? What's, what did you, what did you, what's It was my, my last day. My last day screening. Yeah, that's right. At the, there was a, the, oh my Hollywood gosh, that's the CW. Really, I totally remember. And yeah. It was like forever ago. Yeah, it was, it was a really long time ago. It's so good to see you again. You too. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Hey, everybody. Thanks for hanging out with us. Mm -hmm. Hi, guys mm -hmm. and gals. Hi, friends. So I wanted to tell you why, a little bit more why I'm doing this. Um, October is Bullying Prevention Month. And as you know, I can't travel anywhere to speak. And it's kind of driving me crazy that I can't go out and do what I love to do, and especially during this month. So I figured I would reach out to some people and see if they would want to talk to me <laughs> about their experiences. Um, mostly because of my experiences, just one, you know, there's so many other stories, as you know, there's so many other stories that need to be told. And I think it's so interesting, especially to hear from people like you to know what your experience what bullying has been like, whether it's been growing up or, you know, as you've been older, like, what have you, what have you dealt with, with like bullying or even cyberbullying now? Well, I mean, first of all, I just want to say you're such a, I hate, I hate this, the word's so strange because like we have so, there's so much inspiration porn everywhere, but you really <laughs> are. And, and I believe what makes someone inspirational is what they choose to do with the tools they were given. And um, and you are someone that has just done and doing incredible things, not just for yourself, but for so many people and building compassion and creating empathy and fostering like this, this, like this de-otherization. Yeah. Right? It's Thank just so, you. And I just appreciate you and how you use your platform and, and all you stand for. Thanks. I try. I try to do what I can. And you're doing for it. For being stuck at home. <laughs> I know. I know all of us are, um, but but um, in terms of in terms of bullying, I have a complicated relationship with bullying because yeah? I've been both the perpetrator and the victim. Really? Growing up, yeah. So I, um, I I write about this. I have a book coming out in in April um, about my journey with you know masculinity and undefining it. And as I was writing it, I was realizing like the complex relationship I had with bullying because, you know, the social construct that masculinity kind of um, exists within teaches you that you need to be at the top. Yeah. You're not rewarded for being at the bottom. Right. Um, so we're, we're, we like are, are socialized to police each other and bully each other in a way to almost become like, alpha or like bigger or better or stronger than another man right and all of it is rooted in the same thing which is like insecurity number mm -hmm. one because we're it's coming from a place of being afraid like we're afraid we're not going to be enough we're afraid right. we're not going to be 
the biggest or the best or the strongest or like you know a man a real man yeah and and what it does is it creates this strange culture where at least for me i was bullied i get bullied but then i don't want to keep, feel that way so i then go bully someone else to be above them and this is you know what, what I mean? you did yeah this is this is not just what I have done, but what I believe I would argue most men have yeah. done. Yeah. And, and for me, it was hard because, you know, I wasn't always whatever uh, Instagram or social media considers me. Now, I wasn't like, you know, the Raphael Jane the Virgin guy. Growing yeah. up. I, I was a misfit. I didn't have a lot of yeah. friends. Um, I, uh, I, I definitely wasn't the guy that always got the girl. I was always, I was perpetually in the friend zone. I, I was picked on and bullied. I was small for a long time. Mm -hmm. And for me, that looked like a lot of things. It looked like, you know, um, kids pointing at me and laughing at me and talking about me behind my back or like on purpose doing things or like putting signs on my back that said like, you know, um, you know, some derogatory slur or something. Yeah. You know, it, it's crazy it, to it me was... that that actually happens. I feel like that's something you just see in a TV show or a oh, movie. No. no, no, no. And what's funny about it is like, it's done in a way where it's funny. So yeah. like, I'm supposed to laugh about it, even though yeah. deep down I'm totally humiliated. Yeah. Um, it's, I've been, I've been, you know, I've been bullied in the sense of being hazed, you know, on, in, on soccer teams, you know, being tied to a goalpost, you know, as a freshman and um, wow. chased around. Like, you know, we, had, I grew up in a, I grew up in Southern Oregon mm -hmm. uh, in this place called Medford, which was recently really affected by the fires. And our high school had, this thing is called uh, open campus, like an off campus lunch. Oh and yeah, we had that. You yeah. Had this too. So you would like leave your class at lunch and you could go to the cafeteria, but most people, if you were cool, would like get a ride to lunch. And if you mm -hmm. didn't have a friend with a car, you would walk. Right. And that walk was kind of like the walk of shame. Because you were walking? because you were walking because you weren't cool enough to get a ride or because you were a younger kid or you were a freshman or something yeah. and, like, you were a nerd or whatever, a loser, whatever they called us. And the upperclassmen would get huge, like 32 ounce, um, uh, whatever they were like seven 11 of Cokes. Yeah. And they would, they would drive by and throw Cokes. No at us, way. Um, just because they could and then laugh. And then you'd go to class and you're like, and so you would go to, to lunch. And I remember having this fear of like, the last thing I want as a freshman is to be coked. They call it was like, it became oh, a bird. It became, wow. it became a bird, by the way. And my yeah. school coked. Because then you would go to class and you were clearly like a loser. Yeah. because You were drenched in coke because you were someone that walked to lunch. It was like, that's how deep that's crazy. And, 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 and strange that kind of culture became. And then so what I found that I ended up doing was to make myself feel better. I then participated and it sucks that I did in making other people feel less than because it made me feel more than. And that's the, that's the, if there is a toxic part of that type of culture, that's what, it, that's what it is. Yeah. Um, and I cover, I it gets, you, it gets but, you nowhere. You're like, you're stuck in this place of like, you're not progressing because you're, you're seeing, you're doing what you're taught. And it's, I mean, it's something that is way beyond bullying because you, you grow up doing what you see and what you know. And I think that's why it's so important to always look at both sides and not just, you know, be compassionate for the person who's the victim. You need to be compassionate for the bully because what are they seeing at home? Why don't they have the resources that they need to be able to express how they're feeling well hurt people hurt people Lizzie. yeah you know it's one thing that we yeah. know is um so much of like if you ever if you were to, if we were to like find a cross-section of people that have that are the bulliers right um mm -hmm. the the and just and just traveled the country and we just interviewed them and right. we went into their home lives and we and we asked them questions. I bet you nine times out of 10, we would find that they're dealing with some sort of undealt with trauma mm -hmm. or they're going through or they're experiencing pain. And the way that they the way that they allow themselves to cope with that pain is by then perpetuating that pain and making somebody else feel it. 
Right. And that's why someone like you with your platform and your power, like how you're able to find compassion for the people that treat you the way that they treat you is just, it's such a heroic, like superpower that you have that, that I hope that the people that are watching you or that follow you really, really learn from. And that I'm learning from is that like, you know, you still have compassion for those people. And, and I believe that that's important because the second we then otherize the bullies, and then mm-hmm. make them feel worse or punish them or like call them out and like destroy their lives. It just gets worse. There's yeah. no healing that can ever happen. Yeah. I mean, you know? I credit every, like, thank you for saying that. I credit all of this to my parents. I mean, they're the ones who started mm-hmm. this foundation for me and it's, they started the same foundation for my brother and sister as well. And our faith is a huge part of, you know, forgiving people and, having compassion for people. And it's what I saw growing up when there were adults who would ask my parents, why don't you feed your daughter? Or if there were people in the grocery store who were following us down the aisle just so they can point and stare at me. And learning and witnessing my parents' true forgiveness and then wanting to go up to the person and saying, hi, this is my daughter. Would you like to meet her? Versus how dare you do that? What are you thinking? Like you're, you know, just fighting fire with fire, basically. Um, if you think about that, Lizzie, what your parents did, um, that is the key and the secret to everything. Mm-hmm. Like, what if we could do that in all aspects of life? Like, look at our country right now. Yeah. We're split in half, right? What if yeah. we were able to apply that same teaching, that same learning that your parents instilled in you, where instead of calling them out and like attacking them for doing what they're doing Mm -hmm. they handled it with love and with grace and with respect and 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 they they called them in versus called them out like what would our country look like if if trump supporters and like biden supporters could call each other in instead of like fighting and hating and you know i just wonder what our world could become and that's why the bullying conversation is so much larger than just bullying It's, it's like if you can teach people compassion and empathy like the way you are like wow. imagine how that can spread it would be a game changer i mean like even you're a game with, changer with what huh you're a game changer oh thanks you are too oh. even with like everything going on now like it's crazy to see just the word empathy just brings so much meaning and power and i think with that also comes incredible and intense vulnerability that we need to be able to have and share and be open with. And even with you talking about, you know, having times where you were the bully, I commend you for doing that because most people would just sort of hide that part away and just say, you know, I was the victim, this happened to me, but not really acknowledge what they were doing to other people. And I mean, it does, it bullying can even come in the form of not say I was the bully and I, you know, I never bullied someone out in public or someone I didn't know, but I was mean to my siblings or my relatives. In a sense, that's still being the bully. What made you sort of, what like opened your eyes to, I'm going to stop seeing what I'm doing. I'm going to stop seeing the problem and I'm going to start transitioning to do something about it. Because a lot of your work is highlighting different stories and they might not necessarily be all about bullying, but it is about you know, telling people and sharing about compassion and things like my last days. And what, what brought you to that? Well, like you, Faith, honestly, I mean, I think, I think the, the belief in something greater than ourselves is really important, especially right now. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, I believe you're Christian. For me, I'm a Baha'i. Yeah. Um, I believe in the unity of all religions, like we're all one. Yeah. And that we are, that none of us know none of us know we can have our faith our belief but none of us know what happens when we die we have a belief in what happens but i do believe there's a there's a quote from baha'u'llah in the baha'i writings that says we will see all that our hands have wrought w-r-o-u-g-h-t like all that we have done Mm -hmm. all that our hands have touched in our lifetime and it makes me just think about wow (laughs) well what am i doing what are my hands touching are they are they being used to build somebody up and something up or are they being used to tear somebody or something down right and if i'm going to see and i and i believe that i will experience all the pain that i've caused 
Yeah. And, and, and I'll also hopefully experience all the, the love and the joy that I've caused, right? Yeah. Like I, yeah. What I hope is that the glass is half full there. Because, mm -hmm. you know, we're human. We're all going to make mistakes. And that's why I think the best thing we can do is model vulnerability as a way to teach empathy and build compassion. Like what you are doing, right? Yeah. Like you're out here saying, like, I'm bullied. Look at how I'm being treated. And you're not out here secretly, like, going on Twitter and, like, you know, making somebody else feel like crap. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, like, there is a temporary feeling that comes from that. There's a temporary feeling of power and, like, oh, like wow. Like a temporary that's... high. And that just leads you down to a darker, right. darker hole. And so to answer your question, it was a combination of faith. It was a combination. Like, I was, I was always a really sensitive person. I'm, I'm still a, I'm way too sensitive to be in the public eye. My wife, my wife will verify that. <laughs> um, because I care what people think. Like, I'm not one of those people that say, like, ah, whatever, F them. I don't know how those people like do me. that. Yeah. I care. And yeah. you can look at that as a, as a weakness or a strength. And one of the, one of the ways that I consider it a strength is because when I have participated, like when I was in high school, and I did make somebody feel less than, or growing up in my insecurity, I overcompensated and hurt somebody else. That high, that mm -hmm. quick second where I felt stronger was followed by a much darker feeling of shame uh, and a longer and more depressing feeling of shame and like, and, um, and just and, and embarrassment and also just pain because I, I know having been bullied and been hurt, I know what it feels like to be that person. Yeah. So I know what I'm doing. Right. I know what I did. Right. And I was like, and then I go, how could I ever do that to somebody else? And luckily, through faith, through my experiences, when I have acted up or when I am acting like an idiot, it helps me come back faster. Mm -hmm. It helps me apologize faster. And, and like, because we all, we've all had those moments where you'll say something and you'll go like, why did I say that? But you're yeah. still in the conversation. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's because we know that we're compensating. We know yeah. that we're just really insecure and we're saying something we don't believe in. And so at the end of the day, that's what it is for me. It's like acknowledgement, it's self-awareness. It's asking myself, why? Why did I say that? Why, where did that really come from? What am I trying to heal in myself by making somebody else feel that way or by calling somebody out? And maybe there's a better way I can do it next time. Right. Um, so. Oh, such a good answer. Such a good answer. You should write a book. <laughs> April 27th. What's it called? It's called Man Enough, uh, Undefining My Masculinity. Oh, that's exciting. Are you doing an audio book? I am. I think I, think I am. I'm currently, I, I still have like three more weeks to finish it. Um, yeah. So it's not, it's not quite done, but uh, we'll, we'll for sure do a live or so when I'm getting ready to put it out and I'll send you a Yeah. Costume. Yeah. I'm excited to read it. So I have my last nice. question. And it's sort of right. a transition. Um, still on the same topic. But you do have two small children. Mm. What are you instilling in them when it comes to not only bullying, but sort of acknowledging other people who are different. And I know now it's very different with COVID and seeing other people in person is just yeah. you know, not the same anymore. But what is, what are you in, what are you teaching them? What are you and Emily teaching them? It's a really good question. Um, especially because I, I recently, and I, I joined TikTok recently and I saw what was happening. Dark place. Uh, dark place, man, this inter the internet, this world, but that's why these conversations are important, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so much, so we, we have a, a very dear friend, we call him Uncle Chris, who has no arms and no legs. Mm -hmm. His name's um, uh, Chris Koch. And I hope that everybody uh, looks him up. Um, he's amazing. And we didn't know exactly the right thing to say to the kids. And I want to be, uh, I want to be open here and honest, because I believe that parenting, you're going to make mistakes. Yeah. And you don't always have the right way or the right thing to say. And you don't necessarily know how to introduce somebody to a kid because, you know, unless you're reading a hundred books, you do your best. Yeah. In some ways, uh, I learned from Chris as an example, the best way to handle this, like how to teach my kids, because what he's, you know, being friends with him and being around him a lot, 
I see how people look at him. He rides a skateboard with no arms and no legs. And he, just like your parents do, he comes up to, you know, he disarms them. He comes up to people and he's like, hey, how's it, you know, and yeah. they'll call him out when they're looking at him or whatever. Yeah. And people are like always coming up to him and giving him money. And he's like, I don't need your money. I got money? Yeah, it's crazy. Like people think in their minds that they have to like be a, a savior or like a helper to somebody that has a, you know, that has a disability in some way. And that's the opposite of what people should be doing. But he, he likes to find the good in that. Yeah. Which is like, oh, they care. Yeah. It's misplaced, but they care. And he could so yeah. easily be like, dude, screw you. Like, I'm fine. I don't need your money. I have a job. Mm -hmm. But he's more like, no, hey, go, go buy somebody that doesn't need, or the, go buy somebody that doesn't have something right. like that. Yeah. So when, when he came over the first time, our kids were scared. Mm -hmm. Maya was, well, Maxwell was super small, but Maya was maybe two. And she had never seen anybody without arms and legs. Yeah. And it was about explaining um, that just because somebody looks different doesn't mean they're less than, mm -hmm. or doesn't mean there's anything to be scared of. And we had to walk her through um, what happens when you're born and, and in the right. world, how we're all being, you know, and how we look, how some people look different. And just like what we're doing right now, teaching them to see color, not to not see color, right? Mm -hmm. Like teaching them that they have white skin and that person has black skin, but, yeah. but, but, um, and how, but how that's beautiful, like a, like a garden, right? Yeah. And our, in the Baha'i yeah. faith, we're told about how beautiful a garden is because of its diversity and because Ooh. everything looks different. And so that's one of the things we're instilling in our kids now is trying to teach and expose them to all types of different things, to young people and old people and, and our friends that, that maybe might look different or we have, right. you know, somebody that doesn't have our arms and legs and explaining to them that it's, it's what's in the heart that is the mm -hmm. same and not this, not this, all of these bodies, these, are, yeah. these are temporary things. And that's the other yeah. thing that we explain to them is the body is only for this world. Mm -hmm. The body is just here when we go to heaven we don't take our body with us yeah and everybody's got a different body and everybody is unique and does good things and does amazing things in their own way mm -hmm. we can never look at somebody else's body or their face or whether they have arms or legs and think that they're uh any less than just because they're different because we wouldn't want someone doing that to you yeah so that's what that's like what we're trying to digest but when you're five yeah. or three it it's comes hard out differently well as someone who you know is on the other side of that i appreciate that more than you i think it's so great when parents are open about it with their kids especially because kids are afraid of what they don't know and they have no filter and they'll say you know the first thing that comes to their mind and they shouldn't be blamed for it and yeah. if they're curious about someone I always tell parents, don't push them away. Don't tell them, turn away. Don't tell them, don't look or, you know, it's wrong. Just look yeah. them in the eye. Just tell them, hi. That's it. That's the first place. Can I ask you a question, is, though? Can I ask yeah, you, Rizzi, yeah. like, what would your advice be, not just for us raising our kids, but, like, walk us through the, you know, the thousand people that are here right now that have kids. How would you, how would you want a parent to um, to teach their child in a gr in a grocery store if they saw you randomly, right? Yeah. For COVID, and they had never seen somebody that had your features. How right. would you want? How would you want the parents to use that as a teaching opportunity? What should a parent do? My number one thing is acknowledging the other person as a human. That's my number one thing because we go out and we already feel this sense of I am different. And I know it, and it, you go in and you feel like you're wearing this, this like, I don't want to say badge or uniform, but you go in knowing, like, with this prepared mindset of, like, okay, I have to prepare myself because I can't regularly walk into this grocery store. And I, I don't know if this is from my childhood or, you know, feelings of automatic or whatever it is. But if I see a little kid, even now, and I'm 31 years old, if I see a little kid, my instinct is to sort of step away and to sort of just hide away because I get, I get afraid and I start feeling those emotions from when I was young of, I don't want to, I don't want eyes on me, so I'm going to hide. So I think for parents, what I would say, and one day when and if I become a mom, I will teach them 
that looking the person in the eye and smiling is your number one step. Because if you look at them and you have this look of fear, the person who is different, the person who you're, you know, looking at, they're already going in with all of these emotions. So the second they see this facial expression of I'm scared or I don't know what to do, you, you just want to run away. You don't want to confront the situation. So for me, it would be acknowledging they're human, looking them in the eye and smiling and saying hello. And then some people might not feel comfortable asking questions about themselves or answering questions about their situation, which is completely fine and understandable. Um, but to know that if the person is willing to answer and say, I'm in a wheelchair because, or I have two different colored eyes because, um, that it's okay to ask and it's okay to be curious about it. Mm. I love that. That's so helpful. You should write a children's book if you haven't already. That's my, that's my, my dream, my goal, my next project is to do a children's series and to have Let's all do it together. the main characters. I would love that. Have all the main characters not only have a disability, like not a physical one, but either come from who are adopted or who are immigrants or whose parents are gay or lesbian, you know, like different things like that, because we expect kids to understand about these things, but they're only learning about them for a few minutes in a day. But when yeah. you see like a, like a cartoon or you see something that they see regularly, you're stopping what the kids are afraid of because they don't know. And you're giving them something to understand and look up to. So I don't know. I get really excited talking about that kind of stuff, but that's really, I really that. what I, I want to do. I'd next. love to develop something like that with you, Lizzie. That'd be awesome. Yeah. So we'll see. Anything. Well, this was such a great conversation. Oh yeah. Thank you for thank you for hanging out and wanting to chat. I so appreciate it. Of course. Congratulations on clouds, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. My emotions uh, haven't been at the level to where I can watch it yet. Because no. I read I watched I watched the original My Last Days when it came out. And yeah. then I read Zach's mom's book. I did her audiobook. Oh, it's so I was powerful. a wreck. I was a wreck. It was so good. Well, so good. I promise you the movie is hopeful and inspiring. I'm excited to watch it. Whenever you're ready, whenever you get yourself there, and then text me afterwards. I will. I definitely will. But thank you, thank you so much you. for talking to me again. I really appreciate it. I so appreciate it. Let's do it. We'll do a duet on TikTok, okay? Okay. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> I got to get, get in there and figure that whole app out next. Yeah, it's, 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 a, a it's, it's a challenge, but it could be worth it. <laughs> we'll make it a, we gotta make, we gotta bring the light. We gotta bring we the do. light. I think we can do it. I think we can. <laughs> oh, Liz, you're the best. I so appreciate you. Keep oh, doing, doing. We need thanks. you. Thank you. I'll All talk right. to you later. Bye. Bye. Everybody. Thanks for hanging out.